Gentlemen, uh, welcome to this uh, session, which is the last session of Electronics 2015 in Palanga. Uh, this session is mainly in the area of electronics. <coughs> we will have presentation and research work in the area of uh, grid and smart metering, sensor-based body temperature control, power optimization or energy optimization, and PWM pulse with modulation. Um, I'm glad to announce that all presenters are here in this session, so hopefully it will be a really productive session. Um, I just want to ask uh, the presenter, please uh, follow the 15 minutes uh, presentation, including the discussion as well. Um, the first presenter is from Czech Republic, Wojtek Blanik. <laughs> that was my be best pronunciation. And the title of presentation is Control of Grid Connected Modular Multilevel Converter. Please. Okay, Mr. Chairman, um, thank you for introducing me. Um, good morning, uh, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Wojciech Blahnik, and I'm from the University of West Bohemia, and I currently work at the Regional Now Innovation Center of Electrical Engineering. And uh, this presentation is about a uh, modular motor converter. Uh, this is my presentation. Outlines a uh, few words about the um, multilevel converter based on Pascal Bridge topology. Uh, after them, the, a few words about the control and uh, the final the simulation and experimental results. Uh, the main objective of our research was to design an ACDC converter, uh, which is fed directly uh, from the 6 kV uh, AC grid, uh, it doesn't mean uh, without the uh, bulky transformer, and uh, the final power of our uh, converter was designed for uh, 6 uh, megawatts. Um, uh, our proposed topology is based on a uh, cascade HPH uh, converter, and uh, there is a 3 HPH converter per one phase. Okay. One, two, three. <coughs> and the main attention uh, of the control is um, concerned uh, to the voltage balancing uh, of the voltage on the output of each cell. Uh, and uh, this uh, voltage balancing <coughs> is uh, solved separately at the control structure level. Uh, our design at control use three separate control ops. It doesn't mean uh, the first uh, control ops or the uh, first phase and the same uh, control ops uh, for the uh, B phase and uh, C phase. And uh, in, in this, uh, it's the same for each phase. And uh, the control is composed of uh, the uh, mathematical <coughs> model, uh, voltage control op, uh, where it's uh, used P control and uh, uh, current control uh, lobe there's a direct current control which provides by a uh, proportional resonant controller and also the path for the balancing uh, of the voltage. Uh, the modulation in this case is uh, PS, PWM uh, and it's realized in FPGA. Uh, and now in detail the control structure for the converter uh, it's uh, for the single phase uh, part of the converter uh, the mathematical model is uh, based on the uh, mathematical description of the motor converter and uh, the output modulation signal is there uh, the voltage uh, in this case, uh, it's the control, the sum of the voltage of uh, this three cell uh, to acquire value. <coughs> and uh, it's, there is use a uh, 
Kaseik uh, PI controller uh, and the output uh, value is a magnitude uh, for the requirement current. Uh, it does it mean uh, there is a computed requirement current? Uh, this is the, the green one. And it's a uh, compare uh, with the actual current of the converter. And the uh, error is uh, the input uh, signal for the uh, proportional resonant converter which provides the direct current control. Uh, the output signal is uh, summed with the mathematical feed forward term and the uh, output, uh, the final output signal is the modulation signal for the first cell of this converter. Uh, the second and third uh, modulation signal is computed uh, and uh, it's uh, uh, there's a the, this sig signal uh, can be uh, different. It uh, depends on the voltage on uh, this uh, voltage, uh, on the output voltage of this cell. Uh, in this case, uh, we have uh, the first cell as a master a master uh, mode, and the second uh, it's in the slave, and there is in the slave too. Uh, does it mean uh, we use a different between the output voltage? Uh, of the first and second cell, uh, it's an uh, input uh, for the PI, PI controller, and uh, this output uh, modify the value of the modulation signal for the second cell, and the uh, same way is used for the death, uh, death modulation signal. There is uh, use a uh, uh, different between the voltage of the first cell <coughs> and the last cell. And the modulation technique in this case is a phase shifted uh, PWM modulation technique, uh, which provides uh, the voltage at the uh, converter AC side uh, will be in this case uh, 7 level. And uh, it's a standard uh, modulation technique for a multi level converter where is the three uh, source signals. Uh, with a uh, fixed uh, phase shift <coughs> and uh, the modulation signal in this case we use a three modulation signal uh, it doesn't mean the first uh, for the first cell, second for the second cell and so on uh, and now uh, some simulation results uh, the, um, there is used uh, some equivalent current source as a uh, load uh, because uh, we need to test it, uh, convert the behavior under, un, uh, under non-symmetrical load. Uh, it's uh, the f f first, uh, first behavior where, where the uh, converter under symmetrical load with uh, 9.45 kilowatts. Uh, there is a three-phase uh, voltage and uh, the three phase uh, currents which are in the phase against voltage. Uh, this is um, a converter behavior for the step change of the symmetrical load. But the interesting uh, it's uh, this, uh, this figure where is the converter under symmetric non symmetrical load. Uh, and the balancing voltage, uh, does it mean uh, the voltage uh, are controlled to the requirement value and in this case uh, it's uh, during one second. And uh, for the non-symmetrical load also uh, are the different uh, value of the currents in each phase and also uh, the current uh, ripple is different. It's caused by uh, different uh, modulation signal for each cell. And uh, now some uh, experimental results. Uh, in this case we use a for the each cell uh, separate uh, controlled inverter which uh, provides uh, some uh, ch changing the load for each cell. Yeah. Uh, the final test was uh, uh, for, for the reducing uh, power mm -hmm. just for the 1.1 uh, kilowatts 
and uh, the control was uh, implemented in DSP uh, Texas Instruments 335 and uh, PSWM uh, was uh, realized in um, FPGA modulator Altera. Uh, this is uh, the behavior uh, where is the converter under startup uh, sequence. Uh, the converter uh, current was uh, limited uh, by the proper function of the proportional resonant uh, controller. Uh, there is a uh, the final uh, voltage, uh, final voltage of the AC on the AC uh, side of the converter is uh, the se se seven level, and uh, after them the current uh, ripple uh, are lower, yeah, and uh, the current is also in the phase against uh, the uh, source voltage, and now uh, the. Uh, last uh, experiments, uh, the converter are under non-symmetrical load. In this case, uh, the second cell of the converter is loaded uh, just 90% against the first and third cell. Uh, and uh, during one second, uh, it's uh, stabilized the voltage to requirement value. Okay. Uh, this control provides uh, voltage balancing uh, on the individual power cells. What is important on the directly uh, to the control structure level. There is not necessary uh, use some uh, change in in, in the uh, FPGA modulator, and uh, it's a, a the very simple and powerful approach. Uh, it can be used <coughs> implement uh, and we use just the conventional proportional resonant and uh, proportional integral uh, controller. Thank you for your attention and your question are invited. Any questions? Nothing? All right, thank you very much. Thanks again. The uh, title of second presentation is Deeper Layer Body Tissue Temperature uh, Control Using Multisensory uh, Transducer. Measurement of uh, deeper layer body tissue temperature is very important for many purposes. Uh, for sportsmen, for uh, people who work in, in uh, extremely uh, environment. Uh, it is known some methods for measurement of uh, body uh, temperature. Uh, this method can be divided in two classes. Uh, it is non-invasive method and invasive method. But uh, invasive method, uh, which is uh, used now, is uh, uh, can be used only in uh, a clinical environment uh, and. To but this purpose is very important to have device and method to measure temperature of uh, uh, body tissue with, with uh, non-invasive methods. Design design for monitoring of uh, deeper layer human tissue temperature uh, when. Uh, 
this way is uh, cooling or heating. Uh, our idea was uh, to form a design of a transducer in which uh, we can form two uh, channel for a head flow. Uh, we hypothesized that uh, these two flow uh, can be equivalent. Can be equivalent. And it's very important to cover uh, these um, channels from uh, environment because uh, environment uh, as show our praxis uh, have very important uh, influence in result of uh, measurement. Uh, on ground of uh, this design, we can do uh, equivalent resistance at circuit of these two head flow channels. Uh, what is shown in this thick tube and uh, from this uh, equivalent circus we can give so uh, equation for first channel and for second channel and if we hypothesize that both uh, flow are equivalent can you equivalent and uh, Uh, this condition, we can derive equation for uh, calculation temperature in deep deep layers of uh, tissue. Uh, but for uh, experiment we can do digital experiment and physical experiment for the digital experiment let's use a penny uh, equation and uh, value or value for uh, modeling this use it this uh, uh, which is used for modeling in uh, in many many times in many articles are published. Uh, because uh, in construction we use uh, thermistors and uh, for linearization of thermistors uh, characteristics we use uh, well known standard Hard equation is uh, this six equation, and uh, <coughs> for experimental producer, these thermistors, uh, these thermistors were used from uh, company Canterm, and uh, after after calibration and uh, calculation coefficients. Uh, three coefficients for transistors. Uh, we have uh, accuracy for transistor uh, 0 0.02 uh, degree Celsius. Uh, results of modeling uh, test the uh, uh, distribution of the temperature fields in tissue and under um, temperature transducers when our environment uh, temperature is plus 15 grad Celsius. Uh, why 15 grad Celsius? It, uh, uh, usually this temperature is used when uh, uh, 
physiological experiment are conducted. I'm uh, it is uh, important uh, to uh, select ratio of resistance for uh, model and this conduct modeling uh, numerical modeling uh, temperature <coughs> and uh, ratio and uh, what you see uh, from ratio 4 uh, change is uh, minimal According to the results of uh, numerical simulation under ambient temperature, when degree and uh, under uh, transducer, it is uh, skin surface with 30 uh, point neuro. Valti valley or also measurement temperature on the physical model using experimental transducer this 50 plus minus zero uh, 0.28 degree and uh, second experiment was for uh, environment temperature 15 Celsius then we have some results of measurement Uh, using this uh, results of measurement, we can uh, calculate the temperature in deep uh, uh, layers of uh, muscle. Uh, this is uh, made numerical experimental experiment for uh, approximation using uh, different uh, order of polymer and uh, for six order polymer we have this this result and uh, for a higher order of polymers uh, it uh, haven't uh, more, uh, more uh, exactly results. Uh, for uh, calculation of deep uh, layers temperature, uh, we have uh, equation, and uh, according to this equation, we are calculated uh, temperature in the deep of uh, 3 centimeters in respect of skin surface. Why 3 centimeters? 3 centimeters centimeter usually use it all, all many of uh, the researchers in the world and uh, needle probe, needle probe, which uh, use it for direct measurement of uh, temperature in uh, deep layers uh, usually is uh, about three centimeters uh, long uh, according to our results uh, muscular temperature depth of uh, three centimeter measured using proposed uh, methods and transducers uh, 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 in technicals was 32.45 plus minus 0 uh, 0.0.6 degree and uh, this uh, value I measured using needle thermometer was this one that is uh, different no 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 not not uh, big but uh, Using 
Nidlja is no one want to insert three centimeter under the surface. Uh, and this is uh, not fun and it's uh, danger. <laughs> <laughs> and conclusions. The use of the proposed design of temperature conducers uh, contains uh, four precision thermistors. It's a novel non-invasive way to determine a uh, temperature of the virus uh, of uh, tissue. Uh, it's known uh, some uh, sensors with uh, two thermistors uh, <coughs> and uh, a zero flow uh, uh, method and another. As I say, to ensure that both the tissue measurement accuracy, three T uh, inducer must be covered using a cap with good thermal isolation that minimizes the influence of ambient uh, temperature. Uh, we use it uh, to retain a foam, uh, type thermoflex. It is uh, in practice the better thermoisolation material. Uh, transistor was uh, attached to the body using elastic band and uh, can be inverted in cold water because uh, physiological and the experiment they uh, use uh, immersing uh, lack in cold water and uh, for 15 or 30 minutes. It is not, <laughs> not fine. Uh, but uh, this time we can control uh, this road uh, using need letter uh, thermometer. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I'm sorry for my bad English. I saw that. Uh, any questions you want to ask? Uh, I just, I have, uh, this it was very interesting, but probably we can give the government a little bit of a Może, 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 how fast does it settle to this value when you attach it and apply it? How, how fast do you if, get if a you step put, result? If you put person under water, <laughs> <laughs> yes, left or arm, only left <laughs> one arm, you must write uh, 15 minutes or 30 minutes. Okay, but above the water? I mean, in the regular? Uh, no, it's just so. This problem that uh, changing uh, of muscular deeper layer temperature is very slow. And down and. Yeah, the situation. And it is uh, some data that uh, under very high load of man temperature of body uh, might be high 41 degree Celsius. This is very high. Yeah. If more, uh, it is death. <laughs> but uh, it is uh, experimental data from soldiers oh. which go in march with all ammunition. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next presenter is from Czech Republic, Pert Milinek.
and title of presentation is Heterogeneous Network for Smart Metering Power Line and Radio Communication. Okay, thank you for interesting. Uh, my name is Petr Minek and I'm from Brno University of Technology from Czech Republic and I would like to say a few words about the heterogeneous network for smart metering issue. The outline of the presentation is the following. I say a few words about power line communication, then about simulation of radio wireless network and finally about heterogeneous network and the proposed uh, hybrid pow power line wireless module. The motivation of this work uh, was uh, to answer uh, on this uh, question, primary of the, the first and second one. What is the primary motivation for deploying of the wireless power line network and uh, which uh, power line communication standard will be deployed for the future smart metering issue? There is no doubt that the future smart grid uh, will exploit multiple types of communication technologies. In this figure we can see the example of the smart network and if we divided the network on the transport and access part we can say that the for the access part there are the commonly most widespread technologies are radio <coughs> and uh, power line communication. The power line communication can be divided according to the frequency band into broadband and narrow band. The broadband achieves uh, high data rates, but there are problems with noise, communication range, repeaters and so on. Therefore, they are directly uh, focused on uh, home area networking, internet access, building automatization and so on. On the other hand, the narrow band power line communication uh, achieves high communication range, but with small data rates. Therefore, they are used for smart metering and uh, remote uh, data acquisition. The big advantage of power line communication like wireless is uh, that they uh, doesn't need new wire. But there are also many uh, disadvantages like uh, power line characteristics, especially noise. In our work we propose the experimental radio network which uh, contains uh, short circuit current indicators on uh, power line poles and we want to uh, simulate in the radio mobile software, the signal coverage, attenuation and pad losses. In this figure we can see the example of the signal coverage without repeater from one measuring point to data center and uh, they, are, uh, they are not in direct line of visibility. Because there are uh, obstacles in the form of the mountains, as we can see in this figure, therefore we simulate the signal coverage with repeater and uh, we propose some repeater height and when we want to achieve the at minimum reserve of 6 decibel, the antenna height must be located at a minimum at, of 15 meters. Therefore, the single radio technology for smart metering or smart grid issue, uh, in, in our opinion, is a problem because there are necessity of repeaters, there are obstacles in the form of mountains, buildings, forests and so on, and also there are big influence of the weather. Therefore, we propose the heterogeneous hybrid network for coverage large or rural remote areas, which consists of uh, power line communication and wireless. After that, we want to uh, find which power line technology fits, fits best for smart metering issue. I can say that the narrow band power line has several advantages in comparison with broadband power line. Because the broad broadband power line solution are not directly designed for smart grid issue, they are designed for home area networking and so on. But high data rate narrow band power line stan standards directly uh, target on smart grid requirements. After that, we analyze low data rate and high data rate narrow band power line standards, and it is possible to say that uh, low data rate standards uh, can be considered as frozen. But on the other hand, the high data rate uh, narrowband power line standard are today still being deploying. From the application point of view, we must uh, take in, into consideration two uh, contrary requirements. Robustness and long-range communication against high-speed data rates. Therefore, we uh, carry out some <laughs> experimental measurement with this type of uh, power line communication modem with uh, different uh, topology size and so on. 
we measured uh, loss rate and data rate for different uh, standards, modulation and uh, modem type. According to, to this result, we choose the solution from uh, Maxim and this type of modem. And we uh, develop the hybrid power line wireless module uh, based on G3 standard and chips from Maxim and also with wireless solution based on XB Pro 868. This uh, module can be used uh, for hybrid heterogeneous network but also for some redundant path or redundant channel. After that we carry out some measurement only for the power line, uh, power line communication part in, in this condition and in this uh, figure and in this table we can say the data rate for different type of modulation or modes. And I would like to finish with some conclusion. Uh, we propose or introduce two possible communication techniques for smart metering and uh, smart grid issue, the radio and power line. They are also different, but for example, high speed internet everywhere in, for example, in every electrometer, I think it's, it's not impossible. Nowadays, it's commonly used for uh, remote data acquisition for electrometers, especially mobile network, but there are also disadvantages in price, response, and so on. Therefore, we propose the hybrid uh, power line uh, and radio module, which can be used, for example, uh, in uh, street light control and so on. And uh, the communication will be the key aspect of the future smart grid and smart metering deployment. Thank you for listening. I'm open for some questions. Audience, any questions? So may I have a question? You know, that's very interesting. Really, so and uh, how, but however, just uh, if you use wireless, you use radio. It's not power line. The power line communication is usually directly power line. It's only for the button. It's not important things. But if, if, you, if I'm not wrong, you install antennas in some cases on the on the on the tower of the and then send the information, no using line, just use the radio. There's nothing to do with power line, but doesn't matter. You know, that's. However, you, in this way, in your way, you have to, to overcome some obstacles like this. We have a some similar problem in, the, in using the power line. Probably we could use a wireless, wireless application, since when you have a joint of the cable inside, and the, and, the, and the cable is very long, about 1.5 kilometers. Therefore, attenuation is very hard. Therefore, that's the problem how to calculate. We use uh, inductive calculators, and then attenuation is very high. Perhaps it would be your idea, it would be okay. If we use a modem, special modem, on one side and another side, we could send the information by using wireless. That's, that's a very good idea. Yeah. But the narrow band standard can achieve the distance of kilometers. Yeah, but we use um, uh, BPL. BPL, yeah. BPL is for only for short, yeah. Yeah. short range. Outlined disadvantages of both of these technologies, but I finally didn't get what you propose. Either you propose to use all these two networks in parallel, and then some intelligent node defines which channel data was or managed to arrive, or you propose to run on certain segments uh, wireless, on other segments power line communication. Which is your uh, proposal in this situation? Yeah. We receive the measuring point of the short circuit current indicators on the pole. They are real installed. And therefore, we want to find a solution, different solution, uh, to communicate uh, from this point to the data center. Therefore, we realize some simulation is possible. And the wireless, only the single technology like wireless, it is not possible to use. Therefore, we propose to combine. combine and uh, for example, for uh, remote data acquisition for electrometer, the first part, the access part of the path is uh, mostly used power line communication. After that, they use different technologies. That's why we think that it, is, it will be better to combine technology, not use only one single. But always it depends for the area. Okay. So you got your answer. Okay. Any? Uh, you have uh, USB-X-B, uh, 
Um, but uh, this technology is it uh, capable of uh, intermediate blocks? That is not direct line of sight communication, but communication through intermediate nodes? Uh, um, we try to realize the communication without repeaters because this is expensive to install and find uh, the location but if they are possible to install and locate some repeaters that, that is no problem to communicate So there were no communication nodes in the line between the transmitter? No All right, uh, if you have further questions, you can catch up with the presenter after the presentation, after the, this session. So, um, next presenter is from Estonia, uh, Tassif Ahmed. We'll be presenting power optimization in heterogeneous scattered radio network. Thank you for introducing me. Uh, power optimization in a non-coordinated second infrastructure in a heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous cognitive radio network. Hello everyone, my name is Tosi Ahmed, and as he already mentioned, I'm from uh, Tallinn Technical University. Um, I'm doing PhD in uh, Department of Electronics Engineering. Uh, this is my <coughs> basically topic of research and let's see what we have in our presentation. Uh, some key points which I will be uh, giving a brief overview would be an introduction about cognitive radios, then my system model which is basically based on a decentralized network architecture and how the cell is basically operation, uh, uh, operating and simulation, some results and in the end conclusion. Basically why uh, we need cognitive radios? Cognitive radios uh, were put into the picture because uh, the assigned uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. So the spectrum which we have to use for the communication, a usable spectrum, has already been assigned. According to one survey um, report which I have uh, studied some time ago, there is uh, almost 85% in US uh, spectrum go underutilized. The spectrum is already assigned, let's say, to TV channels, but uh, the 85% of the time it's being underutilized, so it's unavail uh, it's available. So researchers have uh, proposed this kind of a radio that called cognitive radio. That is basically smart, context-sensitive radio that can be programmed and configured dynamically. So if you you must have many of you have seen movie transformer. So it's basically a radio transformer which basically adjusts itself according to the radio conditions and environment. So uh, radio, uh, cognitive radio is basically the kind of system which enables the, this kind of a dynamic uh, spectrum access from another uh, resources like the people who have paid for this spectrum. Uh, cognitive radios basically uh, work in, in a cycle that is called cognition cycle, spectrum sensing, spectrum mobility, spectrum decision, spectrum sharing and environment. So here is the part which I am actually researching on spectrum decisions and sharing. So this is uh, um, the thing which I am mostly focusing my research on. For example, this is a decentralized network. Basically, I am considering myself only to the three cells, one cell, two cells and three cells. And this is basically second devastation. This is not, not the uh, <coughs> like a permanent uh, setup. So it's like an ad hoc network. So uh, decentralized network architecture means that they don't have a backbone network which carries their information between the, 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 the base station. So this architecture is basically every cell is independent from each another. So in this uh, cognitive radio architecture, these cells can be um, uh, owned by different vendors. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> uh, what is basically my contribution in the research community? For example, this is one radio base station and this is my uh, area of interest and uh, how basically decentralized architecture works. Every uh, base station hosts some kind of uh, algorithms or software which um, do this kind of a spectrum sharing and decision making tasks. So here this is the co component which is very uh, key in my uh, research. It's based on the RLDSA. DSA is the dynamic spectrum access methodologies and RL is the reinforcement learning technique. So, um, this technique has been previously used 
and I'm uh, reusing it in uh, my research to further enhance the uh, the, the vision. Uh, for example, uh, this uh, whole architecture or this uh, part is basically um, called the DS RLDSA controller. It's basically sensing the environment. Could be uh, measurements based on uh, the user's choice. Um, could be SINR, signal to nice and interference ratio, spectral efficiency, and another thing. So here there is another uh, feature involved, which could be an optional uh, feedback from the environment. So based on the environment, this or reinforcement learning based algorithm, it sees that now which channels are available. So we have to move uh, our users to that channel. So basically, this is the the, um, the key component here. So how basically cell uh, is operating? E cell uh, is trying to achieve the best possible spectrum allocation, and there is one uh, um, you can say like um, um, a constraint that th all these cells will not try to uh, um, assign spectrum. So they have a kind of uh, relationship. One when one cell is uh, doing the uh, spectrum management, the another cell is uh, doing the operation. So it's not doing the offline uh, management. So basically. Resources are basically assigned on the medium term basis. So after a few minutes, it's not like every other second there is uh, this algorithm because this algorithm is cost uh, costly and it creates overhead in the communication. So that's why it's taking some time. Um, then um, how this procedure works, basically the reinforcement learning algorithms, they start from a random combination of the available frequency channels. And then uh, they assume that which one of is better based on interacting, based on this kind of interactive interactive measurements from the environment. They see that which uh, channel is better to uh, for the um, for the assignment. <coughs> and basically, this is my contribution towards this. That how previously people have used uh, frequency optimization, but not the power up they were using the constant power so here i propose the concept that power should be optimized let's say the per people are the the user who are at the edge of the uh, the uh, cell they need more power as compared to the people who are closer to the cell uh, cl closer to the base station so there should be a balance between the power some should uh, someone should have higher power someone should have lower power so this is the basically objective function or the optimization function which during the iterative process we need to maximize in order to achieve uh, the higher power for the resource uh, for the transmitter but uh, depending upon the constraints that it should not generate any interference to the neighboring cells who are using the same frequency bands so some of uh, these uh, constraint uh, on the power allocation algorithm that power should cannot go more than the, the available power in the cell and <coughs> The second constraint is that the uh, the power assigned to any transmitter should be less than a threshold. The threshold can be uh, assigned by the user, or it can be set by the environment that what uh, whatever the um, interference is being received from the other cells uh, that should be below this limit. And if this uh, this frequency carrier the uh, the chunk is not being used, so the, the the transmitter it means that frequency channel can have that power so this this condition would be null and void and only this condition would be effective so basically uh, i have uh, com considered two simulation scenarios one as uh, it was done in previous uh, research that with the constant power uh, transmission power and then uh, comparing these results with my uh, power optimization algorithm so based on uh, this I, I will show the results what are the results basically uh, some simulation parameters that uh, uh, the users are basically scattered randomly home, uh, in the cell, but they are not moving. They are like fixed during the simulation time. And the, uh, the number of the users, they are also constant. Cell load, it means cell load is not changing. And all the users are trying to capture the maximum battery. So we, I'm considering the full load buffer model. So it means all the users are trying to capture as much resources as possible. So it's, it's like a worst case scenario for the, uh, to, uh, to analyze. <coughs> Some other uh, parameters. I, I would not go into the details, but if somebody is interested, that what was uh, the thing. 
So some results basically uh, I would define the spectral efficiency. These are the three parameters on which I am uh, mating the results and comparing my results uh, with each other. Spectral efficiency is basically the amount of successfully delivered bits per unit of time per spectrum. Um, and then the second uh, component is basically the user's uh, satisfaction, uh, the user happiness. But it's of course we don't go and ask user that are you happy with the services. Uh, it's based on the measurements from the environment that the, uh, the quality of service which user is being received. Is it okay? So it's the percentage of amount of time when the user throughput is below the target throughput. It's called dissatisfaction probability. And one very common and very well-known signal to noise and interference ratio. <coughs> I'm sorry. So here are the, the figures. This is the uh, figure with the constant powers. Um, and this is the optimized power result with the little gray color. So here it's not so big, but there is um, a very small di difference is a big difference in the communication system. So um, here I'm achieving 4% efficiency, 4% uh, gain in the spectral efficiency. Uh, if you compare the system, both system in the signal to nice and interference ratio, then it's some parts I'm getting up to 10 dB gain and the lowest gain where I receive is around 0 dB. So overall the system is performing better. The power optimization has not degraded the, the system. Although it's a very uh, complex and um, heavy uh, algorithm, it takes time, but it has not degraded the overall performance of the system. And dissatisfaction probability here, it's not much uh, difference. It's more or less the same. So what is the, the basically go, uh, the moral of this story here? that if we compare this uh, place, it means uh, spectral efficiency, which is the throughput of the system. So it means that there is a throughput available in the, as compared to the same uh, satisfaction level of the users. We have more resources in, uh, we have in the same resources, more bandwidth available for, so it means the capacity of the overall system can be increased. Maybe five, 10 users can be put more in the cell. So b this is, uh, you can say one, um, positive aspect. Conclusion and some future work. Uh, basically, novelty of this work is uh, on the reinforcement learning based uh, spectrum uh, assignment technique and based on power optimization. But this is a basically a suboptimal approach. Why? Because reinforcement learning is one separate algorithm, power optimization and separate algorithm. So you cannot run both these at parallel time. So one will iterate, another will compute on based on that value but still it's giving us better performance as we have seen in previous slide some future work would be some dynamic environment where there could be more macro cells femtocell combination uh, could be computed mostly people don't consider handovers and i think i'm planning to do some uh, simulation based on the handovers that how the algorithm will behave when there is uh, there are handovers and finally, there is uh, a key um, thing where people are like, like trying to, uh, it's, it's like a new phase, new area, cognitive wireless sensor network. I am planning to apply this uh, power optimization and frequency optimization algorithms to the uh, sensor network techniques, uh, sensor network. So that's uh, basically uh, my research. And uh, thank you for your attention and time. If you have any questions. We have two more presentations, but if there is a question, please be sure. No, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. Uh, I will be presenting the next paper, Novel Smart Echo Model for Energy Consumption Optimization. This is the Internet of Things approach, actually. And uh, this research is joint collaboration between the Department of Electrical, Electronic, and Computer Engineering, University of Pretoria, and uh, University in St. Paul the Apostolic Republic of Macedonia. 
The outline of my presentation is introduction, uh, energy management process, overview of advanced techniques uh, for data analysis and our proposal, and we conclude the presentation at the end. Uh, for introduction to uh, what is the motivation of doing this research, uh, we can see that we have uh, growing in global population and um, there is a statistic that is saying that we have almost 80% of carbon emission in the cities and um, cities also represent three quarters of energy consumption. So what we are looking for, we're looking for a sustainable environment. So we, our goal is to reduce uh, carbon emission and also the best thing for us is also to reduce uh, energy consumption. So what is the approach? One approach can be like uh, moving to a smart cities. So uh, smart cities in terms of managing the cities, in terms of uh, improving quality of life and also reduce this uh, carbon emission which help us uh, in sustainable development of sustainable uh, environment. For sustainable energy management and smart cities, uh, of course we must have uh, standards and architecture available. So how we can have a smart cities now? Uh, one way is we start to have a smart homes. To have a smart homes, uh, one way is to uh, start having sensors, uh, like um, for every appliance that using the energy. We consider a sensor and we interconnect all the sensors together and we try to measure the energy. And of course there are some external parameters like weather or uh, user behavior pattern which may, may affect the uh, power consumption. Uh, energy management process, first we uh, define uh, energy management, a process of control, monitoring and conserving energy uh, consumption in a building which lead to uh, save the power uh, consumption, save uh, energy and also reduce negative <coughs> impact on uh, environment. This process as you can see we have four steps. The first one is measuring energy consumption, uh, I'll explain how and collecting data. And in the second stage, we try to make a data analysis to find out possibility to save energy. And in the third uh, uh, step, we try to analyze um, <coughs> collected data to see if there is any uh, improvement in energy. And we can also repeat this algorithm for improvement. For the first phase, which is uh, measurement of the energy consumption, we can use uh, smart devices like uh, interval metering system, which uh, automatically measure energy, uh, energy consumption uh, in regular time intervals. And the output of data can mm -hmm. be in time and step, and also the value uh, which is measured. But also we can use some of the uh, recently published data set, like uh, Bloody, Ready, and Green, which was published in 2014. But the fact is for this data set, they are very, uh, for a very short period of time, less than one year, and they didn't consider uh, energy consumption for every appliances and not also um, various uh, power uh, measurement unit. We have some other options like using data echo, uh, echo uh, data set, UK data and AMP this, uh, data set, which we go through the details and characteristics of the, uh, each of these data sets. The first one, echo data set is uh, for five um, households in Switzerland and the period of uh, energy consumption was for uh, almost eight months, which is less than one year. And uh, they consider measurement uh, like for voltage currents and uh, phase shift between voltage and current. The second data set is UK Dell, which uh, the duration of energy consumption is 499 days. And they consider reactive and real power recording for four uh, house set appliances. And the last one is uh, AMP data set, which uh, is for two years, and the interval of energy consumption is every 60 seconds. And they don't only consider uh, energy power consumption, but also gas and water consumption. In our approach, we try to use this uh, AMP DS and uh, go through the analysis. This is a basic analysis. Uh, we try to uh, analyze the energy consumption uh, based on what? Uh, for 10 most commonly used appliances like dishwasher, oven, um, hot water, and heat pump. Based on this analysis, we see that uh, this hot water has, and also heat pump, has the highest uh, energy consumption based on the uh, monthly data. And if we go to the next uh, slide, this is the data aggregation for uh, per hour. 
Uh, we can see that uh, heat pump between time 14 to 15 hours as a peak of uh, energy consumption. So this is probably, uh, for this case study, this can be probably, uh, the reason can be correlated to the outside temperature. And uh, to mention that, uh, to correlate between energy consumption and the air temperature, uh, we define a, 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 a new concept, which is DB days and uh, we include historical weather data. That also data is available on dbdays.net. In that uh, dbdays.net, we have also two uh, parameters, HDD and CDD. The fact is, uh, this is, uh, uh, the AMP data set was uh, actually captured in Vancouver area. So for HDD and that, uh, the, the conclusion that we got from the analysis, which is uh, regarding the uh, heat pump, we can conclude the outside temperature is probably is cold. And so therefore we consider these HDD parameters, which show us how much in degree and how long in days outside temperature is below the base temperature. And we consider the base temperature 19.5 degrees. Uh, in the software we can change this temperature and find out uh, also the analysis, more analysis. For the more analysis, we use uh, regression analysis uh, for two <coughs> periods of year, one between April 2012 and April 2013, and April 2013 and April 2014 to find out correlation change in energy saving. <coughs> in this two diagram, what we can see, uh, this line is uh, actually that aggregation line and R square representing coefficient of determination, uh, which, uh, which can tell us how good the correlation is between energy use and degree days. So if this uh, R square is near to one, is the ideal situation, our consumption is good, everything is good. But if it's, it's less than 0 0.8 or 0 0.75, we need some improvement. In this case, the, in this case the study, the heat power, as you can see, is less than 0 0.7 or 0 0.8. Uh, this heat power is acting poor and we need some improvement uh, to uh, like uh, house insulation and or maybe uh, adding new device in the, um, uh, the system that we have or maybe change the user behavior of the system. Uh, based on the advanced techniques, we can see we need some, uh, um, based on this analysis we see we need some uh, advanced techniques for data analysis and also prediction. For data analysis, we can use the non-intrusive load monitoring or the other one is uh, risk scale probability and signal measurement. And for prediction, we can also use data mining, uh, classification, and clustering. Um, very short, uh, we choose um, artificial bees colony algorithm for our proposal. So this is the algorithm. And what we can do based on that, ABC algorithm, artificial bees colony algorithm. We try to have uh, obtain a periodic list of appliances with the current voltage. So uh, <coughs> what um, we can do now, we try to modify ABC algorithm and we add some external parameters like weather or user behavior uh, patterns. And now we have a new uh, concept, habitual average which uh, three uh, parameters, depends on three parameters, time, standard average, and predefined uh, usage. Each of them, for example, time and stamp can tell us checking if use, uh, usage time of a particular appliance is longer than user, uh, usage time for that appliance. A standard average can tell us what is normal usage on average for that particular time of the year. And the last one is telling, for example, uh, we can, the user, can configure at the beginning of the uh, implementation. They can configure the preference um, for that uh, system. Uh, this is the proposed uh, algorithm, uh, smart echo. We try to classify uh, all appliances that we have in one house into low, medium, and high priority. Mm. If the appliance is in the low and medium, we try to um, measure the um, energy consumption and also consider the external values and uh, we can after that send some uh, feedback to the user. For example, in this, uh, one example is here, figure out that your heater can be turned off for the next 10 minutes to optimize your uh, electricity 
use it. Do you want or not? This is one application that we can use. And the hardware that we have in, this, uh, in our system consists of sensors for all appliances, okay? So they measure energy consumption, they send uh, uh, energy, the data to one uh, internal hub, it can be like wireless hub, and this hub will um, run the algorithm, run this um, a modified algorithm, and give feedback to the user. Uh, as conclusion, we try to propose a complete energy uh, management process. Consists of collection of energy consumption data and analysis. And based on the result, uh, actually this is very, uh, we are trying to implement something in the Republic of Macedonia. Um, for the future work, we need uh, some experimental result to conclude this research work. Okay, if there is any question. Um, last presenter. I'll take the public, right? My name is Janis Habek, I'm from Czech Republic, and first of all, uh, let me ask the organizers of this beautiful conference to consider my following proposal. You know I'm the last presenter of this conference, so it would be nice tradition <laughs> to uh, give uh, the last person the right to start the next conference in next year. <laughs> The conference will continue during the year, but of course this is only a joke. Uh, our research is uh, focused uh, on active elements uh, that uh, are uh, or that uh, possess electronic control of gain, uh, intrinsic resistance or transconductance. This is useful for generators, uh, tunable filters and oscillators and uh, of course uh, there are many uh, active elements already reported in literature. Uh, one of them is uh, Z copy controlled uh, gain uh, voltage difference in current conveyor. It's very long name, uh, but the basic is, uh, but the uh, basic is uh, really simple. It consists of two active elements. One of them is uh, operational transconductance amplifier with controllable transconductance, and second is electronically controllable uh, current conveyor of second generation. Uh, that has controllable intrinsic resistance and uh, current gain as is described by these equations. We proposed uh, this uh, CMOS uh, structure. Actually, it consists of three sections. First is OTA, then CCII, uh, and then current <coughs> amplifier section that makes uh, the gain section. Uh, we found uh, the uh, application of this uh, of this active element in man many areas one of them is a functional generator this one is without duty cycle control uh, the structure is really simple it contains or consists of only one active element and one capacitor and uh, it uh, includes one integrator and comparator uh, the behavior is obvious from these equations and uh, the duty cycle is one half. Uh, it uh, provides uh, triangle signal and square signal and also in voltage. Uh, the second uh, solution is uh, uh, only, uh, only improved by this current source uh, that uh, serves as the duty cycle control element. Uh, as will be obvious from simulation results, because uh, we simulated that CMOS structure uh, with these parameters. Uh, this first graph uh, shows the triangle, uh, triangle and square response in time uh, for some conditions. And uh, the second graph shows the tuning range, because we are focused on uh, 
tuning of parameters uh, of these active elements. Uh, the tuning range is quite large. It starts from five uh, and goes up to ten uh, microamperes. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the current that sets the transconductance. Uh, these results are for the duty cycle that is uh, 30 percent. Uh, and uh, this graph shows the triangle, it was 1.2 uh, megahertz, uh, uh, the highest uh, GM available from the structure, and uh, this is the square wave. Uh, just for example, 70% uh, results uh, uh, are almost as expected. And the uh, second application is an PWM modulator that is based actually on two uh, of these active elements and we tried uh, to uh, sweep linearly and also by harmonic excitation and also as you can see uh, it works. Then we tried to measure it. So we had to prepare a uh, behavior model because the silicon structure was not available at the moment. Uh, it uh, <coughs> looks really complicated but uh, it, it worked. And uh, these are measurements results that prove the concept. Uh, these are, uh, these are uh, particular results uh, that uh, show uh, the tuning range uh, in that configuration. Uh, the peak-to-peak uh, -peak, uh, range uh, in case of square signal uh, was constant during tuning process and the triangle peak-to-peak triangle -peak, uh, range uh, was linearly uh, rising and uh, this uh, this graph shows that uh, uh, theoretical results and measured results and are in good agreement in this range. Uh, this is not the conclusion because the works go on and uh, now we have it on chip. So this is the microphotography uh, but uh, proposed and designed in different technology in uh, I don't have it, in uh, CMOS 0.7 because it is much cheaper and uh, it is, uh, it is uh, working very well. And these are some of the initial results because uh, we have it only for a short period of time. So, for example, this is the tuning range of transconductance that goes uh, to minus and plus, uh, plus values. Uh, this is, uh, these are several GM values versus frequency. And, uh, for example, this is uh, intrinsic resistance tuning range also uh, very, uh, very large. So one, one more slide, uh, this is uh, transfer. Uh, as you can see, for example, uh, when uh, interstate resistance is uh, controlled by this current, uh, minus 3 dB range is 18.5 uh, megahertz and uh, so on. So thank you for your attention and uh, now I'm wondering if there are any questions. question? Nothing. Okay, this session ends off here. Thank you for all the presentation and all presenter who presented, contribute in this session and for your support for attending this uh, session. Thank you again and hopefully we see you <laughs> next year. Yeah.